Good morning, everyone, and welcome to First Christian Church of Atlanta. We are so happy to be here today to be able to, and so this is for not just the people in this room, good morning and happy new year, but all the many people that are watching us online, whether right now or later, we are all a member of God's church, and we are grateful to be able to be here. Um, one thing that I wanted to say today was, you know, We've had a rough year. Everybody's had a tough year. We've had it made. I've had it made compared to a lot of people, and I know that. And I'm grateful for that, as I'm sure everybody here is. But there is there is someone that I think that we, I would personally like to tell them how much we appreciate him, and I'm sure you do too, because last year was a tough year, and church had to be done very differently, and we had to learn how to do it differently. And we also had to learn what church really, really means. And that's the gift that I was given, I think, during this past year, as we all have. But my main first gift is, is our minister. Don't want to embarrass you. But I think, you know, to have a minister that has been there for us the whole year, as rough as it has been, and kept reminding us that God is the one that gets us through, and that's the message we keep hearing. But I want to thank Reverend Tom Edmondson for his spirit that he brings to this church and to his relationships with people, to his wisdom. We all know he's very knowledgeable, and he shares that in all that he does. And that's a gift, I think, that he gives the, the world. And his kindness, his love, and his humor, and just the strength that he has given us. And I appreciate you very much, as I know this church does, because you've had a challenge this year. It's been a challenge, but I guess working with humans is always a bit of a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> but of course, just a little bit. But how much we appreciate him and Margaret for keeping this, the office together because he's always thanking everybody. But let's thank him this time. And, um, and this made me think about, you know, this past year we've endured a lot. It's been different for everyone. But this next year, starting out pretty much the same, isn't it? But the good thing is we have one thing that is always steadfast. And I wanted to read just something very short from Isaiah. And it's something that I gain strength from, and I know it's something that Reverend Edmondson is constantly reminding of, 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 us of, all of us. And it says, those who place their hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. May we worship the Lord with gratefulness and renewed strength in his holy word and his steadfast love that he gives each and every one of us. So happy new year. And can we now turn into, uh, look on the, 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 I guess the projector or the sign up there. And we'll join us in our first song, first hymn of the day. It's going to sing verse one and three of joy, joyful, we adore thee. Please rise as we sing.
Amen. You may be seated. Well, thank you to Elder Marsha Moore for those kind words. I'm very flattered and, and grateful. I acknowledge your, your thanks, which I appreciate very, very much. Certainly, it is at times such as we are experiencing that we see the need for a community such as the church. And so either we sit on our hands and wait for something to change or we put our faith forward into our action. So I very much appreciate that. And at the beginning of a new year, we're going to keep on doing what we're called to do, and that is to worship and to pray and to serve. We always come to this early part of the service with grateful hearts to God our Father for all the goodness that he has given us, but we also come with the, the sorrows and the needs and the cares of our hearts, and so we want to lift those up to him as well, as, just as we share them with each other. We also celebrate milestones in people's lives, and we actually have at least one birthday person this week maybe more. I'm terrible at keeping track, but I do know that at least one person has a birthday this week, and he's sitting up there in the choir loft. His name is Ed. So do we have any other birthdays this week that I maybe have overlooked? Well, just in case you have a birthday coming up, we're going to sing for you as well. Shall we sing? Happy birthday. of celebration, celebrating a new year, celebrating a birthday, and so many other things. We bring all of our heartfelt needs and cares to the Lord and to the community. So now we have our time of community prayer followed by the Lord's Prayer. Would you join me? Eternal God and Creator, we approach your heavenly throne at the beginning of a new week and the beginning of a new year faithfully observing a day of rest and worship to your honor and glory. Be glorified today and every day in our lives, in our fellowship, in our prayers, and in our community. We ask you this day to be our shelter in our hour of temptation. Be our light when the day is dark and we do not know which way to turn. Be our strength when the flesh is weak and the spirit troubled or depressed. Be our courage in the hour of danger or the day of adversity. Be our assurance when those we love are taken from our sight and you alone can comfort us. Be our hope when our hopes fail and we are tempted to despair. Be our salvation and lead us to eternal life. And now, Hear us as we unite our prayers with those of all believers in all times in that prayer which you taught your disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now we come to the time to give our, our offerings and our tithes to God. And we know we're facing a new year. And as Reverend Edmund so just said, we want to continue doing the good things that we're doing in our community for one another and for people we don't know. So we pray that, um, that this will be a year that we feel like we have a grateful heart and an open heart where we can give our tithes to, to God so that his church can grow. So if you'd please bow your head right now, let's, let's give our blessing for our tithes. May we give our offerings to you with gladness, dear Lord. Bless the tithes and offerings we give today. Let the majesty of the Father be the light that guides us. 
the compassion of the Son be the love that inspires us, and the presence of the Spirit be the power that empowers us. Give us knowledge, strength, and hope, dear God, as we face this new year, and give us generosity with love and kindness throughout the year. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. And on the first Sunday of the year, we will do what we always do every Sunday of the year, and that is meet about the table of the Lord. If you are watching from home, we invite you to take a moment to grab some bread, some grape juice or wine. We, if you're in the building here, if you did not receive one of these little cups, they're in the back on that little table. It's a disposable communion set. One of our practices as disciples of Christ is that we partake of the Lord's Supper every Sunday. And we do this for the same reason that we tell someone that we love them on a daily basis. Not because it becomes routine or old, but because it becomes stronger and deeper in meaning the more that we do it. So now as we prepare our hearts and minds to receive the Lord's Supper, let us have a word of inspiration. The table is set for our special meal, the bread, the juice prepared and presented. Through this meal, we both serve and share the body of Christ, our Lord. Through this meal, God is making all things new. When Jesus shares the meal with his friends, it is a defining moment, for he includes everyone, those he can trust and those he cannot trust. He declares no one unworthy. Today, we, his modern disciples and friends, are welcome, no matter how worthy or unworthy we feel. For Jesus makes everything new, holds no prejudice, condemns no one, includes each of us as we are, so no one is excluded from this meal. And now for the words of institution. For I have received of the Lord what I have also handed on to you, that, on the, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took a loaf of bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us pray. Most heavenly and loving Father, we come before you as your humble servants to receive the blood and the body of Jesus Christ, your Son, the greatest gifts ever given to mankind. Thank you, God, for our weaknesses and our trying times so that we can be strong in your Son, Jesus Christ. We pray that you will forgive us of our many sins. We can never be worthy of your gift that you have given us. But we pray each and every day that you give us the strength to, and a humble heart to walk with you in this life, loving one another as Jesus taught us all to love. Amen. And now, for those who are here, if you will peel back the top layer of plastic. Oops. I have a little bit of technical difficulties myself here. Let's see. Peel it back and to release the wafer, if we would, let's partake of the bread as the body of Christ. And then to peel back the, the second layer, the layer of foil, to release the cup, partake of the cup in remembrance of his blood that was shed for our sins. And by partaking of the bread and of the cup, we are reminded once again of the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus. Okay. 
So now what we will do is we will, uh, we will read from our scripture for today, which is in Corinthians. And it's the second Corinthians chapter 13, verses 7 through 12. Therefore, to keep me from being for, for elect, wait, excuse me, I apologize. From keep me from being too elated, a thorn was given me in the flesh, flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from being too elated. Three times I appealed to the Lord about this, that it would leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is made perfect in weakness. So I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions and calamities for the sake of Christ for wherever I am where forever I am weak then I am strong God's word for the people who love God Amen. happens to be one of my absolute favorite hymns, so uh, thank you for that, Diane. I really appreciate it. At the beginning of this new year, I wanted to start a series that sort of spoke to the needs that we are experiencing as we put 2020 behind us, as we look forward to what's happening, and so I've uh, created a series of sermons that's going to run for about 10 weeks, and I'm calling it A Faith Greater Than Our Challenges. And so uh, if you've looked on Facebook or on our website, too, you'll see that I've introduced that series with just a couple of little paragraphs. And then for today's message, I have the title and the scripture and a few little sentences there to sort of tease it out. And what's going to happen on a weekly basis is that after the service is over, our webmaster, Nate Martin, is going to take that video and a manuscript of the message and put them both on our website. So if you go to firstchristianatlanta.org, at the top of the screen you'll see the tabs, and there's a new tab there that says Messages. And if you pull it down, you'll see the introduction to this series, and right now at this moment you'll see the title of this sermon in the scripture, 
but sometime later today or tomorrow, you will see a link to the video and uh, actual word-for-word -word manuscript of the sermon. So that's the kind of the goal for this time, and the idea is hopefully to speak to the needs of, of everyone uh, during this time. So here we go. Today's message is called COVID-19 as a thorn in the flesh. On, the, on this first Sunday of 2021, we find ourselves approaching our 11th month of the COVID-19 pandemic. 11 months. It was just about a year ago, around January the 30th of 2020, that the World Health Organization announced that there was a global health emergency. Do you remember that? By March 11th, they had declared it a global pandemic. And by March the 26th, the United States led the world in the number of cases, confirmed cases. From that time on, cities and counties and states and all levels of government began issuing shelter-in-place orders, and our lives were changed. Now we have adjusted to living uh, under social distancing, ordering groceries online, telemedicine, family gatherings on Zoom, and online church. But the coronavirus is not the only challenge that we face. Who would have thought that Georgia would become ground zero of the 2020 election? Aren't you sick and tired of the commercials, the phone calls, the text messages, and your mailbox being filled with all that junk mail? And this is not even the real problem, in my opinion. The real problem is the divisive and contentious tone of this election. And I worry that the long-term effects of this election are going to be lots of finger-pointing and accusations for many years to come. Many have also been touched by death. Friends and family that were lost to the coronavirus on the one hand, and on the other, loved ones who passed away in isolation because of COVID-19 restrictions. We could go on and on listing all kinds of challenges that we face at this moment. And we're all hoping that this year things will change for the better. But what if this change takes longer than we expect? How long can we continue to live the way that we've been living over the last 10 months or so? This is why I want to talk about how we can rise above these earthly challenges by adopting a stronger faith perspective. So in this new series, I want to share some thoughts on developing a faith greater than the challenges that we are facing. While many think that they need an end, what they need is an end to the coronavirus, or more money, or a better job, or maybe just a job. Maybe some people think that what they really need is for a particular political party to win the White House and the uh, Congress. But the truth is quite different. What we need to find is the meaning in our circumstances, and that is where our faith perspective comes in. We will find meaning when we discover the sense of purpose that faith gives our lives. We begin today by looking at a short passage in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Now, if you're like me, you've heard lots of sermons and Sunday school lessons about Paul's thorn in the flesh. And if your experience is like mine, you may wonder how in the world is this preacher going to take Paul's thorn in the flesh and COVID-19 and relate them to each other. So in order to do this, we need to do a little background and of the letter and look at a few terms. First, if you know anything about the Corinthian church from the two letters in the New Testament, then you're aware that they had lots of conflicts going on and Paul worked really hard to arbitrate them from a distance through these two letters. One of the problems he addressed is the pride that some in the congregation felt about 
these experiences that they were having of speaking in tongues. Some members of the church had this gift and some did not. And some of them who had these gifts thought that they were superior to the other members of the congregation. And some of them even looked down at Paul, thinking that somehow he was beneath them. So one of Paul's responses to all of this arrogance in that church is found in the verses that came a little earlier than our text today. So we read uh, 2 Corinthians 12, 1 through, sorry, 2 Corinthians 12, 7b through 10. I'd like to read for you now 2 Corinthians 12, verses 1 through 7. To quote Paul, It is necessary to boast. Nothing is to be gained by it, but I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a person in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that such a person, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. Was caught up into paradise and heard things that are not to be told that no mortal is permitted to repeat. On behalf of such a one, I will boast. But on my own behalf, I will not boast except of my weaknesses. But if I wish to boast, I will not be a fool, for I will be speaking the truth, but I refrain from it so that no one may think better of me than what is seen in me or heard from me, even considering the exceptional character of the revelation. In these verses, Paul speaks as if talking about someone else. But he, it only makes sense if we realize that he's speaking sort of um, as a matter of convention about himself. Is he being ironic or sarcastic? I don't know. But definitely it makes more sense to understand that Paul is referring to himself as having these grand visions that he's not able to share. And he's comparing this to the people in the church who think, hey, we have these ecstatic gifts we must be spiritually superior to others. Paul says all of that, I'm going to push it to the side, because what I need for you is to hear and see something in me of greater value. Now, if we go back and reread the text for today, it makes even more sense. So verses 7b through 10. Therefore, to keep me from being too elated, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from being too elated. Three times I appealed to the Lord about this, that it would leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is made perfect in weakness. So I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions and calamities for the sake of Christ. For whenever I am weak, then I am strong. The contrast between verses 1 through 7a and then verses 7b through verse 10 is the difference between pride and humility. If the heavenly visions makes a person feel pride, then there is also the thorn in the flesh to keep him grounded. And since it is Paul who has this thorn to keep him from becoming too elated, then it only makes sense to see him as the one with the grand visions. In the second half of verse 7, Paul uses two terms to describe the challenge that kept him grounded. He calls it a thorn in the flesh and a messenger of Satan. Both images are describing the same thing, a challenge that he wanted God to remove, but God refused to do it. Did you catch that? He wanted God to remove this challenge, but God refused. So let's look a little closer at each of those two images. What most translations render as thorn in the flesh can just as correctly be translated a wooden stake. As someone who loves Dracula movies, I can't help but enjoy that image, right? 
But for Dracula, the wooden stake meant death. For Paul, it was a hindrance. Seriously, though, the type of wooden stake described by this term in Greek is a stake that's used in warfare, such as, you know, you dig a pit, you put some spikes in there, you cover it up, and then you hope that your enemy will, will find it, so to speak. Or maybe even a larger spike that's used for impaling. And I realize that these are not pleasant images, so I'll leave it at that and move on. But perhaps it has merit when we connect it to the second image that Paul refers to as a messenger of Satan. What the New Revised Standard Version translates as to torment me, remember the messenger of Satan to torment me? It refers to beating or rough treatment. So another image that comes to my mind is maybe one of those mafia goon squads that comes around and you know, threatens to break people's kneecaps if you don't you know, pay whatever. So this is a little bit different than what we usually think of when we talk about Paul having a thorn in the flesh. Typically, when people read this passage, they sort of project themselves into it, right? And they see Paul describing a physical illness like maybe um, glaucoma. It's been suggested that he had epilepsy or some other physical ailment that hindered his work. That may be true, but when you consider the, the extent of Paul's travels and preaching and stonings and all the things that happened to him, it seems not very likely that it was something that would have uh, disabled him so much. Others psychologize the problem and create, you know, maybe Paul had an addiction or some besetting sin. I think the word besetting sin must have been created in churches as a way of trying to link our little hang-ups with Paul. I don't know. I'm asking you to consider an alternative understanding, one that has Paul on this mission for God and the enemy trying to prevent him from succeeding. And if we look at Paul's letters as a whole, we think about the Philippians where he's in prison and there are people that are, that are bad-mouthing him and he may be executed. Or maybe when we look at First and Second Corinthians and realize that he's dealing with a congregation that is fighting and taking sides and contentious, and even some of them are attacking him, maybe that could very well be the hindrance that Paul is talking about, the, the trap, the snare that he asked the Lord to remove, and the Lord said no. Now, if you've ever led in the church in some way, you don't have to be a pastor, you could be an elder, you could be a deacon, you could be a Sunday school teacher, you could be... Uh, a volunteer of some sort, a youth program director, whatever. Have you ever faced opposition? Have you ever had critics? Have you ever felt that those people would just leave the church, everything would be better? Nobody is agreeing with me here. You've never had that experience? Okay, I was beginning to get worried there for a minute. No, we all have that experience. And no, it doesn't have to be in the church. It could be at your work, it could be in your family, it can be any aspect of life at all. You are doing what you believe is the right thing. You are uh, pursuing the goal, the vision, the dream, the calling that God has put on your life, and there are people who don't agree, right? We all, we all have that. Paul says, three times I appealed to the Lord about this, that it would leave me, and we might just as well translate this Three times I appealed to the Lord to release me or to remove these traps. Haven't we done this? Have we not faced challenges and in a moment of weakness asked God to take them away? Make life easier for us, perhaps? And if you're like me, you have probably uh, not had the experience of God saying, sure, I'm going to make it easy for you, right? Right? Rather, God has kept us in those circumstances for some reason. And that actually is the clue. That there is a meaning. There is a reason that God does not remove these obstacles from our path. Even if we don't know what it is. Before we move on, let's look at another biblical figure just for reference. 
You guys remember Jacob from the Old Testament? Jacob was a trickster. When he was born, he was holding on to his brother Esau's heel. Esau came first. Jacob had a hold of his heel. So tra Jacob is translated as ankle biter, by the way. Uh, that may sound like a joke. At least one person smiled. But I will say the name Jacob, Yaakov in Hebrew, means one who grasps. Jacob was fleeing from his brother Esau. And Esau had expressed the desire to kill Jacob. If you have read the text, you may remember that. So Jacob is fleeing, and one night he's in a desolate place, and he puts his head on a rock, he goes to sleep, and he has this vision, right? This vision of a Led Zeppelin song where this stairway comes down from heaven to the earth, and angels are going down, and angels are going back up, and when he wakes up, he realizes that he's had a vision from God. And he feels like this is a confirmation that he is on the right path. Well, he goes on and he has his experience. We'll have to save that for another time. But many years later, he's on his way back to his homeland. He's trying to escape a manipulative father-in-law. He's got two wives, two concubines, and 13 children. And he's alone again at night. He's tried to placate his brother Esau by sending herds and herds and herds of animals ahead of him as gifts to his brother. Hey, don't kill me. I'm coming home, right? And it's nighttime, and he's taken his own family, and he's divided them into two different groups, thinking to himself that if his brother kills one of them, another, the other one will survive. You think he's nervous? And there he is alone as the sun is going down, and what happens? But somebody jumps on him, and they begin to wrestle. And they wrestle, and they struggle all night long until the sun begins to rise, at which time this, this angel, this heavenly creature, whomever, is trying to get away from Jacob, and Jacob refuses to let him go until he blesses him. And you may recall that he gets a new name, which is Israel, but he also, the angel, touches his hip and dislocates it got to be bad, right? If he can touch your hip and dislocate it just like that, he probably had power over you the whole time, which is a lesson for Jacob. And the, the heavenly creature, the heavenly messenger goes away, and Jacob is there limping with a dislocated hip, and guess who he sees coming at him? His brother Esau. So Jacob had to face his brother from a position of weakness. To make this connection clear, remember that Jacob was clever. He manipulated people. The earlier vision of the stairway confirmed that he was chosen by God, but perhaps he let that go to his head a little bit. If so, the experience of wrestling with the angel might have given him a much-needed dose of humility. Could this have been in Paul's mind when he wrote 2 Corinthians chapter 12? Is it possible that people who have these grand experiences of God, this sense of calling, this sense of purpose, sometimes need a little hardship to keep them grounded? That is, to keep them from becoming, as Paul says, too elated? Let's zoom out now and consider a wider perspective. Do we as Christians live in a different world than everyone else? Are we immune to coronavirus or struggles because God is going to run interference for us? No, of course not. Are, we are no better than the Apostle Paul. The same applies to the challenges that we face in this new year. Like Paul, we may want our challenges to go away. We may want things to become easier. But is that realistic? What we need instead is a resilient faith to endure these difficulties, these challenges, these hardships, so that not only can we survive, but maybe we will even thrive with these challenges. Returning to Paul, what can we learn from his experience? If we think of the thorn in the flesh more like a tra trap or a pitfall than an illness or a besetting sin, 
then we can see Paul as a man who's on a mission for God, and the enemy sets challenges in his pathway. What exactly was that thorn in the flesh? Nobody knows. No scholars can tell you what it is. Everybody can guess, and it's just pure conjecture on our part to talk about what it may truly be. Now, he certainly thought the Corinthians would understand it, but it is only conjecture if we try to, to say what it was. And frankly, if we read all of Paul's letters, the idea that Paul had a moral failing just doesn't hold up. So I believe it is a solid interpretation to the text to see the thorn as an obstacle that stood in Paul's path. And we can learn the same lesson that Paul learned. First, God can remove the challenge, but sometimes he chooses not to. Secondly, God's grace is sufficient to our needs. How many times have we just realized we need to stop and just rest in that grace? And thirdly, God's power is made perfect in weakness, or maybe we could say despite our weakness, God's power comes through. What the enemy thought was God's defeat was, in fact, his triumph. After all, what is the cross a symbol of if not God's power being revealed through human weakness? And if Jesus could suffer, why couldn't Paul? Why can't we? Whatever the messenger of Satan intended to accomplish by opposing Paul, it only served to remind him to rest in God's grace, to depend on God's strength, to, even in our weakness, allow God's power to shine through. In other words, that messenger of Satan just kept Paul grounded. And as a bonus, might we say that whenever we face opposition, that it's a sign that we are doing the right thing? Anybody ever felt that way? You must be doing the right thing because people are against you. For this reason, like Paul, maybe we should welcome adversity. Maybe we should welcome these challenges so that in these circumstances, God's power can be made perfect. And what is the coronavirus but another virus. We are observing an unprecedented worldwide pandemic response because there is not a human immunity to this virus. We do not yet have a good immunity response. But does it really make sense to talk about it as if it's going to go away? Like in a few months it's going to be gone and we'll forget about it? Perhaps it will become like the flu. Remember the influenza virus of 100 years ago? Of course not. You weren't alive back then. But a little over 100 years ago, the influenza virus uh, struck the world. It is estimated that from that time until now, something like 500 million people have been infected by the influenza virus. Millions of people contract the, the, corona, the uh, influenza or the flu every year. And in the United States, somewhere between, between 10,000 and 150,000 people die of the flu. And this is 100 years later. This is after we have a herd immunity to the flu. The point is that we have learned to live with the flu. How many of you get a flu shot every year? Why do you do that? Right? How many of you have had the flu? But pretty much everybody? Yeah. I've had it a few times in my life, and it's not fun. But we have reached a stage in human uh, immunity that it doesn't kill a lot of people. Well, actually, it does kill a lot of people, but not nearly like it did uh, at the end of World War I when something like uh, 11 or 18 million people died just of the flu, more than died in combat. Now that vaccines are becoming available, we still don't know how effective they're going to be, but I'm sure that in time, 
they will become more and more effective. We will become more and more able to deal with it in our body. But isn't it reasonable to say that COVID-19 may be with us from now on? If so, we must stop wishing it to go away and learn how to live with it. Originally, I was going to call this sermon, Learning to Live With. But uh, I don't know that that would have made as much sense as the title that I gave it. But this is actually the idea, learning to live with, living with our challenges, living with the, the things that stand as obstacles in our path, and so forth. It is the same with politics and any other challenge we face today. We should work to change what we can change. But we should also recognize that some things will not be changed. We can and probably should pray that God will remove whatever, whatever obstacles that God will remove. But if he doesn't, then like Paul, we should look to that divine perspective. How can living with this be a good thing? What is the meaning behind this challenge? Paul used his struggle as a model to give the Corinthian church, Corinthian church a different perspective on pride and humility. And as we'll see in later sermons, he faced a lot of opposition, including death. So what gave him the strength to endure these challenges? Was it not his faith in God? He believed that he was doing what he was supposed to be doing, and then even that satanic opposition meant that he was, in fact, on the right track. For us, this pandemic has a different side. It has taught us how to be the church in spite of not being together in a brick and mortar building. Now, we'll say there's about spread out through this room and other parts of the building. I won't say we have about 21, 22 people here today, but a lot more of you are online. It has rallied many good people to contribute food and money to the less fortunate, as we have seen week after week with our food drive. It has helped us to learn new skills like how to talk to each other face-to-face -face online and so forth. And if this current political climate has, give, has given us any opportunity, it has given us the opportunity, if we will accept it, to speak out against the divisive tone and actions of our politicians. Because what I see, I don't care if it's Democrats or Republicans, they're all guilty in my opinion, of dividing and conquering this country. And if you look at all the, the anger and the finger pointing that's going on, they're equally guilty. And it is our time to stand up and push back. What they are doing today is only at a fever pitch because there is a runoff election here in Georgia, but they're doing the same thing that they've always done. And we need to push back and tell them we've had enough. If anyone can model a better way, if there is any hope for us as individuals, as a church, as a country, it must come from allowing God to work in us and through us despite our challenges. It begins with faith and it ends with faith. If we feel helpless in the face of a global pandemic and politics run amok, then let's allow God to work in us and through us. Why? Because as Paul says, his power is made perfect in our weakness. Amen. Would you, who are all who are able, stand and join us with our closing hymn.
I'd like to thank all of you who are here today, this first Sunday of the year, both in the building and online, and those of you who will be watching throughout the week. We ask God will bless all of you, bless your year, and again, pray that God will remove whatever obstacles that he will remove, but also that he will give us the strength to rest in his power for those obstacles that remain. Thanks to everyone, as always, to our elder, Marsha Moore, who was worship leader and elder today at the table. Our singers, as always, in the choir. we got Mandy Dixon, Diane Lanier, who was our soloist today, Ed Brucker, and Faith Joku. Hopefully I said that better this time. And Edmondson on the piano. As our minister of music, back in the booth, uh, Saul Lewis and Jim Holiday. Behind the camera, Jill Chu. And we have people in the counting room and so forth. And it's a truly international operation because we have our webmaster who's in Wales right now, and who knows when he'll get out of the UK. Uh, maybe he'll set a record and be stranded longer than you were in Germany. Who knows? But in the meantime, we're still connected. We're connected via the Internet, and we're connected, more importantly, by the Spirit of God. So may the God who gave us the last year and who now gives us this new year and the Savior who has walked at our side every day and the Spirit who filled us with life abundant. Grace this coming year with peace and hope and joy. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.